Many people believe that when you're dead, you're dead. However, the accumulation of personal experiences collected over the years, combined with overwhelming scientific evidence, tells us otherwise. It's simply not ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We live in a culture that has taught us that death is final. We avoid the subject at all costs and live our lives in fear of it. But consider this, you've died and crossed to another dimension only to learn that life continues and it's only those in the physical that grieve. You now embrace death and see it as a graduation from one soul experience to another, sort of like walking from one room to the next. There is an abundance of scientific evidence that shows we are more than our physical body. There are, I suggest, three different general lines of evidence. There's some evidence that people who are now living had lived before and therefore survived that death. The second category is evidence that some people who we now know have died are still around and still living in some form. That also implies that people survive bodily death. And the third line of evidence suggests that the mind can function independent of the brain. Now that does not require that we survive death, but it makes it possible. If mind did not function independent of brain, then obviously we could not survive bodily death. Since the beginning of time, people have had experiences with an unseen world, but skeptics and mainstream scientists have always been quick to dismiss these reports. And now here's why science reacts badly to anomalies. And this has always been the case. This is nothing new. So what we're looking at is a bunch of blobs. Here's a blob about mediumship evidence, and here's a blob about reincarnation evidence and near-death experience and out-of-body experience, telepathy, and so on, EEG correlations. Each one of these things is a body of evidence, but when you look at it, it doesn't make any sense. So now I'm going to give you a way of making sense of what you're looking at. There it is. There's the theory that holds it all together. Now when you look at this for 10 seconds or so, you get emblazoned in your brain a way of looking at these blobs, and now when you look at the blobs, you can't not see the theory that I just presented to you. So science, and not just science, but all of us need a framework as a way to, to understand what we think is going on here. Uh, this, I think this, I, I haven't tested this yet, but I think that this is probably powerful enough so that were you to come back 15 years later and look at this, you would still see the, the dancing couple. And this has, has shows both the power of a way of thinking, the framework and thinking, and also the disadvantage of it, because now you can't not see it. And so you can imagine if someone goes through traditional scientific training and you have maybe 20 years of stuff stuck in your head about the way the world works, it becomes exceptionally difficult not to see the dancing couple. In fact, it becomes so difficult for some people that they will reject any evidence saying that it must be something else. When we talk about surviving our physical deaths, what is it that really survives? Certainly it's not our bodies, it's our souls, or our minds, or our consciousness. Whichever you choose to call that essence that constitutes who we really are. Without our physical bodies, we are entities of pure thought and energy. We now communicate with those in the physical, not with a brain or body, but telepathically, mind to mind. But can physical brains of the loved ones left behind receive such information? So in the West, when we look at this object and we were thinking, well, how does that thing work? Let's think of it not so much in terms of a brain giving out thoughts, but more like a radio playing music. And a Westerner looks at a radio playing music, the first impulse will be, well, there must be something inside this box that is playing the music. So let's open the box with the expectation that we're going to find Led Zeppelin because they must have a little Led Zeppelin in there making the music that the box is playing. So, but then we don't find Led Zeppelin. What we found are things like this, circuits. And if we get a better analysis, we find refined versions of these circuits. And we come to the conclusion that the circuit is generating the music. 
In fact, we even can prove it to ourselves because if we start mucking about in the circuit and taking little pieces out, well, the music starts to become degraded. And so we can very logically and rationally come to the conclusion that the, that the circuit is literally producing the music. And an Easterner will say, no, no, you've completely misconstrued the whole point of the radio, which is that it's receiving something. There's nothing in the box that is actually generating it. It's completely a receiving instrument. So this gives rise to two different ways of thinking about the correlations that we see in the neurosciences. The brain generates the mind or the brain receives or filters something like large mind out there. Both of them would give rise to the same kinds of phenomena that we see in the science lab. As Dr. Radin just showed us, the brain may act in ways quite differently than what we would expect, even being capable of receiving information directly from non-physical sources. This new way of viewing our minds leads us to an understanding of psychic phenomena. Now we can look at the same thing. So here's your, your uh, worldview or your course of your life. And here's somebody else's. And so now rather than saying we're locked on that one line, imagine that you're actually spread out somewhat. So you're, you're reaching out while you're moving along space and time. You're also reaching out to the ends of the universe. And so if the other person is also doing the same thing, then when that occurs, this is no longer your body and the other body, other person's body interacting directly, but there's a non-local connection. Well, that's what we call telepathy. Is there scientific evidence that what we call telepathy or mind-to-mind -mind communication really exists? So does telepathy exist? If this was a, a court of opinion, and of course the science court is much more rigorous than a, a legal court, but if it was something like a legal court, then what would, would we conclude? Well, we find evidence of telepathy in the dream state, the conscious report state, Which, also in the autonomic nervous system and the EEG, the central nervous system, in functional MRI, everywhere where scientists have tried to look for correlations between people who are isolated, we find them and the evidence continues to compound. So this is one way of showing that as the methods of looking for these kinds of phenomena improve and become more sophisticated, we still see the result. Scientific evidence is certainly important, but many believe that direct personal experience is the only true path to knowledge that we survive our physical deaths. Although not always readily discussed, a very large percentage of people have had afterlife encounters. An afterlife encounter is any sense of being connected to or in the presence of a discarnate personality. It can be direct. That is firsthand. It can be while you're asleep. It can be while you're awake. You may hear, feel, sense. Bruce Grayson was talking about, and so was Dean Radin, telephone communication. We believe it seems that it works much the same way. You can be thinking about someone and they'll call. It seems to be much the same with an afterlife encounter. You may be thinking about someone and then that night have a dream, hear a voice, or maybe even look up and see that person. Now skeptics and sometimes mental health professionals will often discount afterlife encounters as a product of wishful thinking, sometimes connected to one's grief. Not only does the evidence tell us otherwise, but such encounters are often life-changing experiences. Now, skeptics, ha ha skeptics always say, well, you know, it's just longing. Longing causes afterlife encounters. Well, I mentioned earlier that I conducted a five-year international survey, and on that survey we found that 88% were not longed for at all. So that has nothing to do with expectation. 11% were unknown to the witnesses and therefore unexpected. So they were not long for at all. Afterlife encounters carry that life-changing, life-changing force. It's a life-changing event, much as the near-death experience. It offers us transcendence of moving from where we were to becoming better and bigger. You know, grief, we can become better, we can become better. It's a choice. We now know that those in spirit can communicate in many ways, but not all things that go bump in the night come from our deceased loved ones. 
And of course, there are apparitions. It's an old term. It's typically connected visually, but people do more than just see apparitions. And it's about interactivity and self-awareness. In haunting cases, typically, if people see a figure and approach that figure, there's no response. It's as if they're talking to a recording, place memory. It's a memory of the place. The place has held things. With apparitions, we're dealing with people experiencing something that someone who is interactive and seems to be self-aware. And that's an important thing. It's consciousness that's still there. So for me, apparitions is evidence of survival. Now, there are some older categories for, for different kinds of apparitions. Crisis apparitions, this is that people will often see an apparition, a figure of a person in crisis. They're in danger, and maybe a relative or friend sees them in danger, like asking for help, or this is the apparition of someone at the moment of death. Uh, shortly after, people typically will see apparitions familially, with family members, with people they really know and care about for two or three days afterwards is a typical thing, but it's typically very close to the time of death. Communication with the deceased often takes place through mediumship. Scientists have studied this process and have accumulated supportive data. Under extraordinarily controlled triple blind conditions, carefully selected mediums can retrieve accurate information that's statistically greater than chance. And by the way, that I've, he I've heard that Dr. Emily Kelly and uh, Diane Archangel and their team at the University of Virginia have independently conducted a, essentially the equivalent of a triple blind study with quote proxy experimenters and they have gotten also significant results. So it's now no longer just isolated to our laboratory in a contemporary way. Now these findings cannot be explained as due to fraud or due to cold reading or siderator bias or experimenter bias, or even mind reading of the experimenter because she was a proxic sitter. Reincarnation has actually been studied by scientists for more than four decades. Researchers have meticulously documented and validated cases of children's past life memories. Even known skeptics find it hard to refute the data. Carl Sagan, the astronomer who was an absolute skeptic, uh, wrote a book called The Demon Haunted World, which was extremely critical of anything New Age or paranormal or anything like that. But in the book, he also included the following statement. At the time of writing, there are three claims in the ESP field, which, in my opinion, deserve serious study. And the third one's the one that's relevant for us, that young children sometimes report the details of a previous life, which upon checking turn out to be accurate and which they could not have known about in any other way than reincarnation. So if our loved ones in spirit choose to reincarnate, how is it that we can still communicate with them? If someone who's died can be reborn, how can they still be available to communicate through mediums and so forth? And the answer is that people who have been through near-death experiences tell us our concept of time is what's giving us problems with this. That once you cross over, what we think of as time does not exist. So we have trouble with saying, how can you be reborn and still be available for this and that? That's because we are thinking of time in our way of doing it. Once you're in that other realm, there is no time and you can do all these things and they don't conflict. People often ponder whether our lives have any meaning and if the way in which we live our physical lives might affect our life in the spirit world. Another thing that might be useful if you can take near-death experiences as having some validity, which, which I think most of us do in one way or another, is to clean up your life. Do the things that will get you clear of conflicts, fears, emotions, poor relationships, uh, stop doing all your bad habits, because uh, as you move through that transition, it appears that all of those come back for you to assess and to deal with. So the fewer of those things that you have, the better you're going to be, maybe even in this life as well. <laughs> and if you look at the scriptures and the uh, stories, you will find uh, transpersonal, you will find uh, parapsychological, you will find spiritual phenomena in every single tradition uh, regardless of who the founder is. And one of the ways that you can look at this is that the founders of these traditions are ones who embodied uh, this transcendent kind of experience that we are discussing. And religions grew up around that, some of them with the cultural artifacts that were going on at that time. But that these experiences, these visions, um, 
uh, these kinds of uh, perhaps consciousness development uh, experiences are at the basis of almost all of the great traditions of our time. So we don't have grandiose hopes that this research will change the way society acts. But we do think that it will change the way individuals think about their own lives and deaths. And I think we are starting to see that the concept of death is becoming much less fearful than it used to be. But this is suggestive evidence. And if you look at these phenomena in combination with the deceased relatives that come to visit and the evidence from mediumship and from apparitions and from instrumental transcommunication and from reincarnation, the only explanation that fits all of these phenomena is that death is not the end, but that death is in fact just a change from one state to another. And when someone dies, the relationship does not end. It continues, but in a different way.